Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 271 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. I am so thrilled that you are here with me today while I am talking to Cassie Roma. Uh, Cassie and I have a great meet cute. Um, how we met is hilarious genuinely hilarious so that is coming up but she was um the first friend that we made in new zealand and she's such a talented writer and a talented marketer and one of those all-around talented people who would make you ill if they were not so fantastic and kind and funny and enthusiastic and um you will be you will be a Cassie Roma convert as well as you listen to this episode. What is going on around here? Uh, 90 days classes just wrapped up and 90 days classes are just opening. So um, if you, I guess, if you hear this and you would like to take one of the 90 days classes by the time this is published, you can go to rachelheron.com slash 90 days to done. That's the numbers 90 and two 90 days T-O done. or rachelheron.com slash revision to look at the 90 day um, masterclasses. I will say that they sell out very quick. Uh, I had somebody once hear this on the day that the class opened, she pulled over on the freeway to safely look at her phone and it had already um, closed. So go look at that quickly if you are interested in it. I always have a long waiting list of people who want to hear first and um, they may have already gotten that email. So that's opening this week, and that is for the January through March cohorts. Um, so that's exciting and fun, and I can't wait to teach that. I'm also playing around in my head with um, another course that I may offer in the future. So I will be talking more about that. Um, writing, I feel like something big happened. Oh, I know um, something really exciting that happened. Stolen Things, uh, which is my second to last book, the um, uh, my penultimate book. It's a thr- It was my first thriller under R. H. Heron. It earned out, and I don't think I talked about this on the show uh, last week. Although I think I meant to, and I forgot. So I will just tell you what earning out means. Do you know what earning out means? You may. In which case, you could just fast forward me. Um, but when you are traditionally published, a publisher, if they give you an advance, that is money that they are giving you, and they are betting on you. So let's take a nice round number of $10,000. Say they give you a $10,000 advance. That's them saying, we hope we make enough on you to justify us giving you $10,000. And then you look at your contract and perhaps on the $17 paperback, you may get about a dollar and that's pretty normal. Uh, So the publisher gets $16, you get $1. And so with that $10,000 bet, They are saying, we hope that you sell 10,000 copies because at a dollar a book that the author is making, you will earn out at 10,000 books sold. If you sell 10,000 books and then you sell 10,001, you get a dollar because they only paid you $10,000 up front. Now, every book after that 10,000, you're going to get a dollar per book that you sell. Um, books don't actually have to earn out to make money for the publisher, as you can see by how much they make on it. And so if you don't earn out, you can still get another contract. Um, and I have indeed gotten other contracts after not earning out. Um, but a lot of my books haven't earned out a lot of them. Uh, so the fact that stolen things just earned out more than a year after it came out a year and a half after it came out, uh, is really exciting to me because I got a royalty check. Um, that's just free money of books that I didn't even know that I'd sold. And here they're cutting me a check that then lands in my bank account and it makes me very happy. So the fact that it earned out is super, super cool. And um, I don't know, it made me happy. And it made me a little bit more hopeful for Hush Little Baby. Oh my gosh, I have dirt. And man, it might be, that might've been a, a bug on my forehead if you're watching YouTube. I was literally just crawling through bushes, picking flowers on a walk. So uh, I hope that was dirt on my forehead, but it might've been a bug. It's gone now. Thanks YouTube uh, for catching that moment forever. So yes, um, exciting to earn out stolen things, hoping for good things for Hush Little Baby, which has not earned out. Um, It's been out for less than a year and the paperback comes out uh, in the Northern Hemisphere spring. So March or April, I think. So fingers crossed for that. Otherwise, I am revising the Replenish book 
Um, and I am really playing around with my next fiction project, um, which is very exciting to me and I can't seem to put it down. I'm really, really loving imagining this project. So that has been good. And otherwise it's just been, it's just been real nice around here. We've been in the house now for a month and there are fresh flowers on my desk and we have a loner dog. Um, I think I might've mentioned this one last week, but there's a dog share collective here and you get to borrow dogs in your neighborhood. And we borrowed Patty all morning. He was here in my office and in my wife's office. And then we took him on a long walk up a hill and threw the ball around and we lost the ball. Oops. And, um, threw the stick around after that. We also lost that stick, but that was less dramatic. And then we took him home and we got a cup of coffee and walked home and it was just, it's just been a lovely morning. So, um, that I'm, I'm really enjoying being here. And that is when I was crawling through bushes and, and picking wild flowers, literally wildflowers, and then sticking them in vases when I got here, because I'm kind of addicted to stealing, let's call it foraging, foraging for flowers on the New Zealand hillsides. I never pick them if they appear to be even tangentially connected to somebody's garden, but I swear to God, all the all the random hillsides here are just covered with wildflowers right now. So uh, yeah, I had a purse full by the time we got home as well as my delicious coffee. I love living in some place where we can take a dog for a walk and pick flowers on the way home after getting coffee and talking to Bruce and seeing um, Bruce's friend Dudley who hangs out at the cafe with his dog, the dude, uh, because we're meeting people and feeling like it's home. So, all right. I feel like I'm re- beating myself from last week. So let us just jump into the interview with Cassie Roma. Uh, you're going to love it. She's so delightful. And I wish you happy writing. If you're not doing any writing this week, if you haven't done any, that's no problem. Forgive yourself and maybe spend 10 minutes today, 15 minutes, sketching something out, having fun on the page, playing on the page. That's how we end up coming back. Not by beating ourselves up but by doing something fun on the page with our pens and our pencils and our fingers on the keyboard, you can do it. All right, my friends, we will talk soon. Well, I could not be more pleased today to welcome to the show, my friend, Cassie Roma. Hello, Cassie. Hello. How are you? I'm so happy to be here finally with you. Like I have canceled on you 32 times. Like we've been having to move this around. I'm just so excited to talk to you. Let me give you a little bit of a bio. um, And then we're just going to jump into everything. So Cassie Roma is a powerhouse in the boardroom in front of a camera and speaking in front of local and global audiences on personal and business topics that impassion her. Passionate about creative content, social media strategy, the influencer economy, and storytelling across mediums, both emerging and traditional, Cassie has literally lived and breathed the digital revolution, all while steering the social media and digital storytelling ships for brands like Air New Zealand and ANZ Bank. She is the world's first queer woman to have a starring turn on The Apprentice Aotearoa as an executive advisor to the CEO on national television. She is a published writer, author, podcaster, videographer, content creator, keynote speaker, TEDx alumni, event and conference MC, occasional blogger, I love your face, occasional blogger, mentor, mama, wife, and full-time hashtag kindness warrior. And after 18 years in New Zealand, this Californian counts herself as a proud Kiwi. Her book, Fuck You Marketing, P.S. I Love You, is out now. Damn, girl. She sounds, she sounds like she needs a break. <laughs> she sounds... She sounds exhausted and exhausting. She, 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 she needs a diet, Dr. Pepper. <laughs> amazing. Well, well, shall we say where we've met? You mean in our bubble breach? In our, our almost <laughs> bubble breach? bubble breach. Would you like to tell the story? Oh my God. It's so, 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 so fun. Well, you had caught sight of me and Lala in the LAX airport and we were coming to New Zealand. You were coming home. We were moving to New Zealand on the same flight. And you were like, look at those hashtag elder lesbians. I've got to know them <laughs> like because, because we were dressed. No, no, no. Don't ever apologize. It's like one of the, we told this story the other day to some friends and we were dying because we were dressed in our drag, in our old person drag. And we were wearing masks and I'm wearing like linen up the union. Laura's uh, but Lala's wearing her, I don't know why I just said that her name like that, dungarees. And, but you were like, 
these are cool people and I'm going to get to know them. And then we're in the same MIQ hotel, same quarantine hotel, and you're looking for us. And then one of my viewers on TikTok said, oh, this is the person that's looking for Cassie over here and connected us. And then we met out on the schoolyard on one of our walks in yes, MIQ. You do. And then we did actually have a little boat above bubble breach while we got a little bit too close to each other. Maybe broke the six <laughs> feet rule down to like what, five feet? I don't know. Um, like five and a half. Yeah. <laughs> but we didn't really get in trouble for it. And no. we have been friends ever since. And you're- amazing. It was meant to be. It was. It was, totally it was so meant to be. be. This is, this, I would say this is out of character for me, but that would be a lie. <laughs> no, this is in character for you. I know this about you now. You yes, are one I of love those connectors. It. Yeah, well, you, I, so our little bubble breach, we had to stay apart six feet in um, quarantine, which was fine. I get it. I understand. Um, but it was like that magnetic thing where we just kept getting closer and closer and closer. But I felt that the first time I saw you and Lala at LAX, yeah. and it was one of those things where I was like, Cassie, don't be weird. Cassie, don't be weird. Do not tweet this. Do not share this on Instagram. Cassie, don't be weird. I got really weird really fast. I think I tweeted before we left LAX and I was like, I need to know these two women. I need to know the hashtag elder lesbians because what did you call your, your fashion style? Was it oh, toddler, toddler, grandma? toddler grandma? Yeah, toddler grandma. Yeah. That's what I wear. That's what I'm wearing right now. I'm wearing linen and glitter boots, you know? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and we both have linen white, and glitter boots. white hair and covered faces. So the funny part was when I did, when we did finally meet Cassie, she's like, oh shit, you're not that old. <laughs> shit. We're the same age. Oh no. And meanwhile, now there's <laughs> hundreds of people searching for the elder lesbians on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact that it like came from a Twitter friend who saw you on TikTok yes. posting about a security guard yes. in the yard. And then yeah. But it yeah. was it was one of those things where it was meant to be. Like I just felt this innate drawing to to both of you, which is why I kind of sat behind one of those big pillars because I was doing the whole <laughs> look around the pillar and then look away real quick. But I'm like that with like all kinds of people. It, and it, it's funny because it's a, it's a certain type of person. It's a certain type of like energy in the world. And I'm always afraid that I'm going to come across as too Cassie because- Do you ever feed, though? Well, the feedback that I get from folks who only ever know me online and then we meet in real life. And sometimes this kicks me in the guts and sometimes I'm like, okay with the feedback. Uh, but it's consistent in that people are like, there's a real- uh, gentility and like a depth there in the way that you want to get to know other people that maybe your excitement online belies. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that's an interesting way to put it, but I also feel like it all made sense to me when you told me on your Instagram live that we were on, that you're an introvert. I'm like, oh, you're an introvert cosplaying an extrovert and you're very good at both. Um, yes. but it's just, it's just been so nice to have you as a friend because, um, I'm telling you listeners, Cassie knows literally everyone in New Zealand. Um, everyone. You will soon too. You will soon too. It's a small place. Small place. I told you guys, we walked in the first bookstore in Auckland and a friend was staffing the counter. It was like, Rachel. So, you know, it was, it is, it is wonderful, but it has been really, really nice just to have you to bounce things off. And like, as we enter lockdown which you are still in day 49 plus 15 day 49 plus 15 in MIQ. Yeah. Um, because for listeners yeah. who don't know, Auckland has really taken the brunt of this particular uh, Delta COVID outbreak in New Zealand and Auckland has taken it for the team with the rest of us are almost at normal. We just have to wear masks when we go in stores, but Auckland is still locked down so yeah. hard. How yeah. is your, how is yeah. your, um, how's your heart? It's, it's heavy. Um, an amazing thing happened. What day are we? Are we on Tuesday? On Sunday. Um, went for a walk out in the hood. And you can go for walks like five kilometers from your house, but you kind of just stay in the same area, which for me means lots and lots of laps. So I've done four half marathons in the last eight days. And I'm wondering why my legs hurt and I can't sleep. My 40 year old hips are like, bitch, what are you doing? <laughs> also, you know, <laughs> I'm like, we've, I've seen you on the track down there. You walk fast you walk real I fast was, I was a real jerk but I was like you know what <laughs> gotta, you gotta move this is get out of the way 45 minutes outside a day I'm breaking a sweat um <laughs> um 
but I was out for a walk and we were down at, it's called Birkenhead Point, which is about six Ks from mm -hmm. home. Um, and we usually come back this way. And all of a sudden there were just these two faces probably about a hundred meters away and they were waving. And I was like, what is this human connection? And it was my best friend and her wife. Oh. And they literally live half a mile, like, so 700 meters from us, door to door, 700 meters. I know we've stumbled that many times up and down the hill. <laughs> and I have not seen my best friend since mid June yeah. or hugged her. Oh. So we couldn't hug, right, we couldn't right. touch, but like us and our bubble breach, we just kept coming. Just kept like yeah, the magnets. So we tried to stay 12 feet apart because of the Delta. Uh, but we got about to the six foot point. We were fully masked. Um, we took off our sunglasses so we could see each other's eyes and do that weird eye thing. Yeah. Um, but it's weird. It's also weird because, uh, since we came back on the same flight, you know what it was like in America in July, as we left, we kind of hit that really lovely three week window of the, the pre Delta. There were only three right, weeks in of the it. States. And we had, that's when and, we had our going away party. We were able to, to do that and thank Jesus yeah. for that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I had, I had been home in years and I, yeah. my grandmother died of COVID. Um, I had a, I had a few uncles that, you know, just when I go home, they won't be there anymore because they're gone. And so it's like, it was three weeks of really intense emotions and family and travel and newness. And in that time, I built some really fast friendships and business um, colleagues. And I'm just dying to get back there because there's so much work to be done. There's so much to see and do and experience and to change. Mm -hmm. And I'm stuck in my lounge. And so you're like, hmm. Yeah. And my brother's got a fourth baby on the way. Oh my God. And, and, and when, the girls. And when Cassie says that she is stuck, what she means is that if she, I mean, you're not technically stuck. You could leave. You could just, I can leave, back. but I can't, I, I, that's right. And that's I have the hard family. part. Yeah. You, you, you have a family, you have a wife and a daughter that you live with right now. The MIQ system is just completely jacked. And it's like, what, what is it like? They, they have 30,000 people trying to get 3000 slots once a week. Is that right? Right. Every other week. And those 3000 spots though, are, it's a lottery. Um, <sighs> and some people, and there's this, this, uh, kind of moral dilemma as well that that tugs at a heart because some people some of those 30,000 people have been gone for two and a half years and are are overstayers now in foreign countries where they could be oh god they could be arrested yeah if they get sent home by a foreign government or they get detained because yeah. they can't come back into their own home god that's heartbreaking but at the same time I'm like I, I gotta see my family and my kid has to hug her grandparents and yeah. I need uh, I've got projects that have been just holding water you know holding yeah. time for two years now that that need to happen that this need to happen you're doing half marathons out of this kind of stress seriously <laughs> and taking on like taking on just like i'm like i'm bored let me just take on all of my corporate projects over here let me pitch my second book write it i sent it off today i did finally you? did it the impetus for it was this call of all things really how so tell me more yeah um, so I've had, I had, I've told you this before, but for everybody who's watching, I had, I wrote my first book in the first lockdown. Um, there's a meme that's going around and it said the stages of lockdown. It's basically everybody's all buttoned up and ready that. to go. And the second one is like the second stage is you're doing your work, but you don't have your pants on. And the third is you're kind of on the floor. And the fourth is you're just a potato. And so I was like, in, in 2020, I was like, I can do this. I started my own business. I wrote a book. Um, I had a, I have a friend who's um, an, a musician and I'm like, I need to buy a guitar. So I bought a guitar. I learned a lot of how to play the guitar. I started to reteach myself. I'm pointing this way because I have a piano over here. I started reteaching myself um, theory and playing the piano. I bought documentary gear. I shot a mini oh documentary. You're the I did only a TV did show. You did a full TV show. Yeah. What, like what an asshole because <laughs> now I'm the potato. <laughs> and the only thing that's keeping me going is these long walks otherwise I would literally be a potato because I think I over egged it in 2020. <laughs> what do you do on your long walks? Are you listening to podcast music? Are you what are you doing? Are you just I thinking? take all of I take all of my phone calls. So oh, I wow. will yeah. So a lot of my American and European um clients 
obviously they're quite ahead or behind us. Yeah. Um, I'll take all of my phone calls in the morning. And sometimes if I've got four hours of phone calls, I will walk for four hours. I would absolutely um, trip in like the second half hour. I would just trip and fall on my face. I, not I don't know if I make <laughs> any sense by then. Um, but most of the days it's, it's probably one or two hours. And then the other one or two hours it's music. So, um, I like you to say my meditation. Oh, I'm, meditation in motion is my big thing. And mm. I've, I've been writing poetry since I was eight or nine years old. In fact, when I was home in July, my parents made me clean out my childhood bedroom. And if you walked into my childhood bedroom in early July, like I did, it was like I had passed away and it was a memorial to 17 year old Cassie. It just was the, the room that I left when I went to UC oh Santa Barbara. Oh my God. Covered in dust. That, oh my nothing God. Nothing had changed. That would feel nothing so moved. strange. And the weirdest thing was to go home in this hyper like emotional state and then to have to go through it. Rachel, I found my grandfather's teeth. When he was dying, oh my God. he had um, leukemia and he, he, di- he was dying for 10 years. But at the very end, uh, my mom and I and my cousin Ashley did a lot to, to care for him. His teeth started to fall out and he didn't want people to know. So when his teeth would fall out, he'd put them in his, um, in his bathroom thinking nobody would know. And then I would come and I would collect them for him. So grandma wouldn't know and other people wouldn't know. And of oh course goodness. I told them, come on. But I found my grandfather's teeth. And so I was like, what am I going to do with these? So I ended up like keeping one. And then I threw the rest away with like old school papers and stuff. And it's like, (laughs) how, how much can a heart take? (laughs) But it was, it was one. Yeah. But it was one of those things where you just go back into the past and, oh my God, I must've found, and not a word of a lie, 20,000 poems that I'd saved over the years. And I was reading back on some of them. I'm like, 16 year old Cassie had not lived, but she was good. Where did she go? (laughs) Like she had not lived, but that kid had lived another lifetime. Like reading through some of this, I was like, wow, she's like in my heart. And that you have the music love, the deep love for music. And you also have the poetry. Are you a songwriter as well? There was a time in my life when that was a thing. There's that was before. mm, That was the before. That was the before. That was before. That, that, have you read um, the new Jeff Tweedy book? I guess it's a little bit new from Wilco. Uh, he wrote How to Write One Song. It's one of my favorite books. It's, it's one amazing. Of my favorite books. It's a, yeah. I'm in you can apply it, right it to now. anything. You can apply you it. You can to apply it to anything. Anything. Any writer will get something out of this, but also I want to write some songs. Um, so, but let's go back to the book you just, you delivered the pitch or the book? Yes, the pitch. Okay, great. So basically, sold the pitch to them already they're happy but then what they wanted me to do was to, to do the chapter flow obviously oh, yeah. and the outline and yeah, all right. of that kind of stuff yeah so I had 90 percent of it done since June and I just was not perfect not perfect not perfect and it was today I was like you know what uh, fuck perfect because to you I'd say Rachel it doesn't have to be perfect it's no. great send it to anybody else I'd say it doesn't have to be perfect no. send it if if Tammy was writing a song and it was a demo, I'd be like, Tammy, that's beautiful. It doesn't have to be perfect. Send it. Get it so 80% of the way see. there and ship it. Yeah. Yeah. But it was but 95. For us, so for us, no, we, we always hold ourselves to such a higher standard. So talk to me about your process of writing the first book. I mean, your process was weird. You're in lockdown. Yeah. You're doing this. Um, and it's called Fuck You Marketing. Yes. P.S. I love you. What led you to write that? So what led me to write that was leading into 2020, I have basically done two decades of accidental marketing, I call it. So I had been working with musicians. I had been working in kind of the industry, working at different venues, working with local. So I went to UC Santa Barbara and a few of my friends were local musicians. So I used to write the lyrics and we used to tattoo around with the music and they would sing and do all the stuff that talented people do. I was just kind of in the background and I, and I loved it, but I fell in love at 21 and I married a Kiwi and had a baby very young and that stopped that. Yeah. But um, marketing became an outlet for creativity and photography and videography and writing and all of these things that challenged me, but also helped to pay the mortgage. Um, and I worked my way up somehow 
through all of the different corporate structures. And I arrived as close to the top as you can get. And I remember looking down from the top after climbing the ladder and going, fuck, I put my ladder on the wrong building. Oh, damn it. That, wow. That's, that's intense. It was intense. And a lot of that was wrapped in and around the fact that most of what I've been doing for my entire career has been um, kind of looking ahead at platform, at social media, at tech, at uh, whatever new evolution or innovation was coming. And I would run up the path and I'd figure it out and I'd blaze a little bit for people. And then I'd run back and I'd bring people along with me. And then I'd run forward, check it out, come back and bring people with me. And every time I'd bring people with me, they'd kind of destroy it. It, Like they would raise the path. They would make Facebook right. something that wasn't connecting with family and friends, but it was a money-making device that yeah. that you know disintegrated things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, all of, all of, democracy as we know it, aren't we? I mean, today as we're filming, this won't come out probably for months, but as we're filming, um, there is no Facebook today. I don't think it's back yet, is it? It is back. Oh, today. dang. And okay. it was definitely an inside job, mark my words. Um, <laughs> I will. You're always right about these things. Well, it's funny because, um, again, back to like knowing people, um, I was talking to some of my friends who are way bigger dorks than me. And they're like, uh, we know the hackers. And I'm like, oh, you know, like the hackers. And they're like, yeah, and here's what's going on. And I'm like, oh, shit. (laughs) Okay. I'm going to go back to like making little videos and telling stories over here. But then also I'm going to just also build the heck out of my email list. So if you are marketing something, if you are an author, build your email list, oh have your gosh. own proprietary let data. Us, let us talk about that. But sorry, I derailed you. You were saying, so you would, yep. you would blaze the path. They would come through and then raise what you had done. So yes. um, what happened So next? that little bit of intense knowing that the goodness inherent in the corporations that I was working for wasn't enough to balance out what I was seeing from the negative side of things made me leave the corporate world. And that was a, uh, late February, 2020. So, wow. I started my own consultancy, which was built upon um, networking trips to Abu Dhabi, Mexico City, Las Vegas, New York, LA, and building up a network uh, in March of 2020. Um, Everything was ready to go and the world stopped. So my big pivot became how do I not become a really cynical, angry person? Because that's not my, my yeah. base setting. And I was like, I got to write a book because I'd won this award here in New Zealand. It was called the Sage Award earlier the year before. And the Sage Award came because um, for the first time in my life, I'd started sharing how I really felt about the industry I was in. And it really resonated with people because it was one of these things where My friend Tammy Nielsen likes to say she delivers medicine, but always with a spoonful of sugar. So I'm a firm believer in that too. You can, you can deliver um, something that that's meaningful and not have to be mean about it. So the book came off the back of me going, this is really resonating and people are literally asking me to write a book. We are sitting still. Um, So I came up with ideas. Uh, There were two or three publishers that were really interested in working with me and everything was ready to go. I had my outline done. I had two people ready to bite and I couldn't write. I couldn't figure anything out. I was writing everything, but the book I was writing, like think pieces. I was reading blog, writing blogs. I was writing LinkedIn posts daily. It's like the most prolific writer you could think of, but I couldn't write my book. So I told the publishers I wasn't going to do it. I didn't want to do it. And I kind of cried myself to sleep for a week. And then a friend of mine said, you know, all those blogs you're writing? I was like, yeah. She's like, what if you treated the chapters as a blog? And oh, I, I like, love it. Yeah. Uh, that? And then it took six weeks and it was done. <laughs> it was literally like, shit. <laughs> Have you ever read The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield? Mm-mm. Oh, I think you should read it. It's, it's short and quick and super, super amazing. He's a, he's a little bit of a blowhard, I always say, but you know, he, he is who he is. And he talks about our resistance, capital R, resistance, always pointing to true north. Like the more you resist, I know, I just saw your, your hair blow back. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> the more we resist, the more we we're stuck and stall. The, the, that is the proof that that is the direction we have to go in. And thank God you had a friend to tell you to do that. Yeah. So, so you're and, doing it. And that's, yeah, go on. I was saying that's, that's kind of when you asked earlier, how's your heart? That's, that's how I'm sitting in it now. So yeah. I'm trying to keep busy with everything, but the exact thing I know I need to do. Okay. Prescription is go by the war of art after we get off this call. Um, okay. I think, I think it will, it'll probably irritate you in just the right way. Like a burr under the saddle. <laughs> Okay, that's so, a way to talk to a cowgirl. <laughs> <laughs> what is your biggest um, challenge when it comes to writing? When you're when when it's actually flowing, let's say, what yeah. is your biggest challenge? Stopping. No, really, you're one of those irritating yes. people. I <laughs> I love stopping. I I love a blank page. I what love a blank? I love a blank page. This so, and I never realized that until I'm going to go. So I'm 40 now. Back 12 years. And I was working with Mighty River Power here, and I had just been given a pretty big role around changing the entire tonality of the brand, how they, everything from like online and social media to customer interaction, to community building, to the letters we sent out to people who were having their electricity turned off. That was a pretty big job for a 28 year old. And I had a boss, a guy called Aaron Ward, who's now got his own amazing business in the States. And Aaron and I, we loved each other, but we would do this when it came to my writing, because I hate it when somebody reads over my shoulder and I double hate it when someone reads over my shoulder and red pens me at the same time. Oh, and he would read over my, oh, oh, he would read over my shoulder and red pen me. And one day I was like, Aaron, you've got to stop this. And he looked at me and he was like, you know what? I hate a blank page. And I love what you do because you give me something to work off of in the moment. And I was like, Oh, I guess that means I love a blank page. You do. And And I I personally, I'm with him. I hate a blank page, but I can revise anything or anyone all day long, all day long. Yeah. So he was was responding to that. Yeah. Yeah. And so off the back of that single conversation, I learned something about myself, but then he and I became this like real well-oiled working machine to the point where I still adore Aaron to this day and we're still in touch. Um, but it was one of those things where I'm like, wow, I really do. If you gave me a topic right now and you're like, I want you to write about Teflon pots and pans, and I want you to make it into a Patsy Cline-esque lyrical, mo-, I'd be like, yes, yes, give me the paper. But if you give me a full chapter breakdown of a book I'm supposed to write with bullet points and everything else already, I'd be like, mm-mm, mm-mm. Nope. That is so interesting. I love hearing this. This is not a, this is not a, a typical response I get on this show. So that is really, really cool. Well, I think one thing too, um, I should probably be open with, cause I haven't really talked about it a lot in public, but the more I do talk about it, people are like, Oh, so I've, I'm dyslexic as well. Ah, so why yeah. not just really challenge yourself in life by, um, <laughs> writing and reading (laughs) when both of those things are really hard to do (laughs) but I think knowing your personality that's why you do them that's part of why you do them and I just there's something about and maybe that's why I like music with very smart lyrics because I started playing music too when I was six years old so I was the last of the first graders um, in our small town to be able to join the local marching band because we didn't have enough kids. So cute. You had six-year-old uh, yeah. marching band people? Uh, there were two of us oh my that God. started at six. <laughs> one of us played the, the, the flute, my friend Laura, and one of us played the clarinet, this nerd. Um, so music was always something that was inherent in what I could do. And I think because it was more mathematical than it was written and, and based yeah. on words, my brain already knows it. We, when a song's coming, I can basically tell you where things are going to go. I mean, I know that's musical theory. I know how that works. But um, if somebody can bring words into that as well, um, then my brain works really well in it. So reading and writing for me is a challenge, right? I can almost hear sound on a page. Maybe mm-hmm. that's why I like the blank page. I've never thought of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes absolute total sense. Besides the blank page, what is your, what is another biggest joy that you have in writing that you found? I think one of the biggest joys in writing is in the sharing. 
because I promised myself a long time ago that I wasn't going to hide what I wrote. Um, and what I found too, especially with, with women and young women, and since coming out with queer people, the more that I write and the more real and vulnerable I can be and the funnier, like I, I love to be, to be funny and make people giggle. Like yeah. even the title of my book, Fuck You Marketing, P.S. I Love You. It's like a little nudge and a kick in the shin, but it's like, the book itself is like, I actually love marketing, but I really want to loathe it. <laughs> but it's so clever and has the potential to change the world and do good. So I like the sharing and people coming back and saying that helped. I like mm. that. Mm, you're so good at that. Okay. So what kind of tip would you share with our writers who are listening? Um, it can be a tip about, about writing itself, or it can be even uh, one or two of your favorite marketing tips for writers. Take this wherever you well, I think from a writing perspective, it's, there's a few things. So the first thing that I've learned recently is, is to be gentle with yourself. Oh, yes. When it's huge, when it's ready to flow, it will flow. And I can say that to you, Rachel, and I can say that to everybody else. But when I look myself in the mirror, which I don't do often, I'm really hard on myself. Yeah. But if you, the more gentle you can be with your process, I'm a firm believer in the muse. I'm a firm believer in ideas flowing through us and, and capturing them when we're ready yeah. to express them. Um, so that gentility of process and being open to a malleable process is something um, I think people should be okay with. Um, I know that when you're making a living off of writing and you have to deliver things at a certain time, that's a thing too. A lot of my friends in Nashville who are writers have to write a certain amount of words for a, a certain amount of publications on, mm -hmm. on a schedule and a timeline. A lot of the time, those are the things that are just chew up and throw out, chew up and throw out. I like the, the, the gentleness. Things. I really, I think the gentleness really still has to come into play though, even for people who are yes. frequently on deadline. Um, I think that that that's how I had to learn to be gentle with myself because I was really killing myself and burning out with deadlines. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things too, when you talk, when you say that, that scared the shit out of me on my first book was I remember listening to Brene Brown's podcast and listening to her, pro her process. And I was like, that's scary. That scares me. I know I'm not Brene, like she's amazing, but her process scared the bejesus out of me. What, what about like, her process? Cause I'm not bringing it to mind. Um, she, um, she was just talking about how she will like close herself away for a certain amount of time. And she focuses in on um, her chapters and she post-it notes everything. And, but I mean, she's, she's all data driven she's and insights science. and right. she's the science of it. But, yeah. but here's what I love. And what I love about people like her, she brings true human insight and emotion to the, to the data. Like she will yeah. distill that into an insight and then she'll turn that insight into a story. Um, that's the, I think that is magic. I think she's she has a changed magical, the world. magical creature. Yeah. 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 So that's kind of my goal. When I grow up, I want to be Brene. I can see that. I can see that. Okay. What else? What kind of uh, marketing tip would you give us? The marketing tip for me. So uh, I actually went with self-publish uh, with my first Awesome. Book. You know, I do both. I'm, I'm hybrid. I do trad and self-publish ah. and, and I love both and I make more money self-publish. Yes. Yes. So I kind of looked at it and I was like, they want the, all the publishers in New Zealand because it's a very small country. And because I was writing more of a marketing business book was like, they're like, you got to put this much money up front for the first print run and you got to back yourself. And I'm like, that's cool. Cause I know in all of my speaking engagements, I could make the money back by selling, you know, schlepping right. stuff. Um, didn't feel like I wanted to do that because if I'm going to sell a marketing book, I better be a good enough marketer to market myself. <laughs> what a good point. But, so I think backing myself was a big one. So I did my homework. Yeah. So the biggest marketing thing that a, a writer can do is do your homework and one of the, the other major things that I did is I reached out to my friends in New Zealand who were published authors and kind of hybrids like you as well mm -hmm. and went, what are the pluses? What are the minuses? What Facebook group should I be a part of? Mm -hmm. What LinkedIn um, community should I be looking at? What have, what's worked for you? And they were so generous with, with what they learned and with what they knew. And so that was one of the things that helped. And then also just getting down and dirty into creating like a tiger team, you know, like who are the people that are going to share the hell out of it yeah. across different genres. So I got 
like my friend Jim, who um, is the CEO of VidCon. I was like, Jim, you're going to have a completely different community to mine. And then I got my friends who are creators who are like in, in entertainment. I'm like, And they go, we don't know anything about marketing. And I was like, read the book. It's actually pretty tongue in cheek. You might just learn about life. They read it and they're like, oh my God, they shared it with their friends. So having that cross pollinization of um, secondary and tertiary audiences, that helps a lot too. So not just sticking to my group, but going, this might be scary to share this book with people who don't work in this the space, but they, but they liked it. So I backed myself and, and that worked. <laughs> it's just so obvious when you say it like that, I'm a marketer. I should know how to market. So with the next book, are you also self-publishing? You mentioned your, how are you doing that? No, I don't think so. Oh, you're going to take the, I, I believe in trying all of the avenues. I really, really do. I, I'm going to try this avenue because it's twofold. First of all, a lot of the heavy lifting will be taken off of my shoulders. Um, being on TV helped with that one. Yeah. So I'm going I'm, to take the the plus. I, I, I've, got, I've got to tell listeners, Cassie is famous. Cassie is like, I have been with Cassie and people like are like, Cassie on the street. They see your hair and they cannot <laughs> not yell Cassie at you. <laughs> it's just so that is a lesbian. That is, it's that fine. Is, <laughs> But that does help. That is something that will help moving forward. In, right. Yeah. 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 Which, which means that I don't have to do all of the, I don't have to do all of the heavy, heavy lifting around even the artwork. So the, my first book, the artwork was a friend of mine who was who really was good. Just a brilliant. She did such a good job. She's just so clever. I mean, she's yeah. clever in the real world. So of course she, she's, she was like, here's a book cover that took her two seconds and it was oh amazing. Gosh. That's not normal. Yeah. Um, I think too, because we were both marketers, we both are yeah. marketers. It was like, here's a really firm brief so that I don't have to ask you 18,000 times about what I want. Um, so that's another thing is being really clear with what you want and understanding the pieces of the puzzle, right? I knew I needed to have a back cover and like all the different pieces. Mm -hmm. I had to learn that and to be very concise when asking for what I wanted. It meant people didn't feel like I was bugging them all the time. Um, how, did, how did you know what to look for? How to learn this? Are you just a, I, personally, I'm a deep Googler. I believe in the power of Google. Um, how, how else did you do it? Same. I like to, I like to learn. I'm a, the most curious, curious soul. I love to go, oh, I want to write a book. What do I need? How do I do that? What are the specs? Does Amazon need specs? Okay. <laughs> Amazon needs specs. What does that mean? The, you know, like, and then also yeah. learning what is the, what is the, um, the difference in the cost between the, the, um, the GSM of the paper in the book right. versus, right. and I was like, do people give a shit if they have a good time with a book? Are they going to care? And then I was like, people who are going to read this are probably going to be older. So I made my font bigger, like all of those. So smart. Yes. I will pick up a book in the bookstore and put it back because of the font. And I'm, yeah. you know, and these are just my 49 year old glasses, you know, what, what about yeah. a person that's their 59, 65 year old glasses? Yeah. And I think that helped having all that really dorky knowledge from, from marketing is I've spent the last 20 years thinking about what somebody on the other side of what I put into the world will think. So yeah. figuring out who my potential audience was going to be and then going, this is how I'm going to have the book printed. This is what I think will look good on a shelf. This is what I think the cost should be so that it's actually attainable for people. There's been quite a few folks in New Zealand and the States who haven't been able to afford the book. So I just send them one. Yes, yep. that's what you need to do. That is what the you kind of message. Do. Exactly. Yeah. You can't give away too many books. I really believe. Hey, I haven't, I didn't, I forgot to look at your book. Does it have an audio book? Not yet. Okay. Talk to me about I was going to do that, but I was going to do that, but then TV happened. Right, right. You can do this in your closet though. Um, reach out to me for that's that right. because I have done it um, a couple times now and it's the best, especially for nonfiction people. Love the nonfiction in audiobooks. I I probably sell as many, maybe more than I do ebooks. So, right. That's good to know. Then yeah. I will definitely do that at least for the second one. Yeah. The first one was pretty funny, so I probably should. My exactly. what uh, the grand plan was was I was going to do the audio recording, but I was also going to do the video along with the audio. And then I was going to release each chapter out into the world because I, I didn't write the book to make money. I wrote the book to help marketers who give a damn and who are, who want to create a more conscious consumer yeah. and who want to create a more conscious way of doing business. So I'd love to just give it away anyways. The next book, not so much. The next well, book, I'd like to make a dollar. 
And you, and you've learned so much from it. And the thing I always say, you know, like people ask, what are the pros of self publishing? And I always say, well, you, you um, have to do everything yourself. And the cons are, you have to do everything yourself. You know, th those are the pros and the cons you, you do everything. And now, you know, all this stuff moving forward. So that's, that's super cool. Keep me posted on how this goes. Let me ask you another question. Uh, what thing in your life affects your writing in a surprising way? Well, I think we touched on it quite a bit. It's music. Um, I actually have two albums that I listened to since I was ooh, 21. So for the past almost two decades, when I need to write and I'm just not feeling like I'm in the right space or I'm getting the right Oh my gosh, I'm dying flow. to know. What are they? Uh, one of them is called Melody AM by a band called Right Shop. Okay, and it's this, yeah, it's this weird, my friend Turtle, when I was living in London, Turtle bought the Melody AM CD and he gave it to me. I think he gave it to me because he didn't like it. I loved it. Um, but it's just, I think it's like 47 minutes long and you can loop it. Yeah. And there's not um, a lot going on. There's not a lot of lyrics playing in your ears to, to, take you off course because my little brain does that uh and the other one is um called blue film and it's by a fellow called lo fang and um that I was love introduced to me by, oh, yeah right so yeah that album itself and that's like another 48 minute album and i just loop those two and that helps sometimes i will get so into especially in revision i'll i'll narrow i don't know if you've ever had this happen but i'll narrow the loop of an album down to one song and i'll put one song on loop and you can yeah. you realize that you've been working for two hours and you have not noticed that the song is just just going around yeah in your head yeah i love that yeah and then it takes you it takes you back to that place it if you, you hear it place. somewhere else there's this one song yeah. that i played a moby song um when this child was dying in one of my books and i if i hear it now i'll yeah. burst into tears yeah <laughs> Yeah. Just thinking how, about but how magical, how yeah. magical is that? And we get how, to create that. Yeah. How, and how interwoven is art and worlds that we get to create? Oh, oh. Yeah. It's the best. yeah. Okay. Speaking of books, what is the best book that you've read recently and why did you love it? Um, I am rereading for the third time, uh, Brandy Carlisle's Broken Horses. And it's on my Kindle. I've got to read it. Got to read it. What do you love uh, about it? That, well, what I love about the audiobook is the uh, like the absolute journey of of music and lyrics and and all of those kinds of things. What I love about the book itself and why I keep rereading it is because Brandy Carlisle is one month older than me. So and she's from the Pacific Northwest. I'm from the West the West Coast. So kind of grew up in like similar but very different um, ways but the similar times, similar music. And she loves Elton John like I love Elton John. I wonder if you'd stayed in the States if you would have ended up dating her. Maybe. <laughs> <Why not? laughs> I'm like, who's going to watch just, this? Let's just say that, let's just say it could have happened in another, in a, in a multiverse. Am I blushing? <laughs> I think That's I am. Awesome. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> remove the jacket okay well that has renewed my pledge to get into that i need to i need to listen to that it's, it's amazing it's it's a really quick read um it is a beautiful read for people who have uh kids who have two moms in a, in a relationship um it is i can see little little whispers of even uh interviews that elton gave in like the 70s and his words that I think only a super, super, super fan of that age group who was going to the library, probably checking out the same books and reading the same like micro fiched Elton interviews would notice. And there'll be things that pop off the page and I'm like, oh, I know exactly which interview that came from. That and it's probably just so part of her brain, like great. it's part of mine. That is so great. I look forward yeah. to the conversation that you will eventually have with her about this because it will happen. Oh, I know you. It, yeah. it will, it has to. Yeah. Um, I love that about it. I love that there's more insight into the marketing and the strategy of of where she was kind of like pre her wife, Catherine, yeah. versus when Catherine came on the scene and how when you put this creative mastery of different kinds together, because they are both smart women. And when you bring them together and you like fuse it with family and love, how this explosion of like just reach and frequency has happened. Oh. And I love that. Oh, that's gorgeous. I love that.
I love that. Speaking of awesome people, where can we find you and all you do in the world? Also, will you tell us just a little bit about your book? More than just the sure. title. Sure. The new there. one or the old yeah, one? Yeah, no, the, the old one. Yeah. The one that people the old can one go that- out and buy or right now. <laughs> the uh, the first book that I wrote is called um it's so old it's like yeah. less than a year old I know <laughs> the old one because I'm writing another one um, <laughs> uh it's called fuck you marketing p.s I love you uh you can only really buy it on Amazon right now and I think mighty ape here in New Zealand Amazon's cheaper I know it's not everybody's first choice but it's it's where I went um and it's it's a deep dive into 20 years I spent in business and it's more life lessons learned and it's it's diving into moments where I just went what fuck (laughs) Uh, and then also moments of just pure unadulterated like joy of watching other people shine and then it also talks about fundamentals of marketing and advertising it goes through channels his, historical channels all the way through to um my best friend laura was my editor and she added a piece about um prostitutes in ancient roman times and how <laughs> prostitutes used to have nails in the heels of their shoes and they would do almost this tap dancing and that was their marketing in the evening so that people <gasps> mm. so it goes all the way back to like ancient prostitutes through to Facebook and Instagram and algorithms that um, define who we are today. It's fun, it's quick, um, and it's empowering. I love that. And where can we find you online? Anywhere where you can Google the words Cassie and Roma. (laughs) It's really (laughs) handy and easy. Yeah. (laughs) The funniest thing is like the younger folks who I mentor these days, they're like, how were, how were you so strategic from day one to get like your name on Instagram and Facebook? And I'm like, I'm old. There were no there at the beginning. (laughs) I'm Cassie Roma on everything. (laughs) I am not Cassie Roma once anywhere. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) On Facebook. I am the Cassie Roma. (laughs) Okay. I am, I am the real Rachel Heron because I blew, I I actually think I had Rachel Heron at one point and I lost it. I don't even know where it went. So yeah, yeah. same, same. So (laughs) she, she gone. Cassie, thank you so much for your time and for your incredible enthusiasm and just um, your beautiful personality. And I'm so glad to be friends with you. I'm so glad you saw us at the airport. I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful. You've been such a help to us. Thank you. I can't wait to see you again. I know, me too.